When we are looking at qualitative studies, we've already talked about trustworthiness and how that's really the key indicator that we're looking at. Each of those five components of trustworthiness we need to really be looking at when we're reading and critiquing a qualitative study. So when we're, all, when we're looking at qualitative studies, we also need to be looking for some of these elements. Specifically, each of the things I'm going to talk about in today's presentation are strategies that qualitative researchers use to enhance the trustworthiness of their study, specifically in the way they collect their data. So let's look at these. I'm going to give you examples of most of these to help them make sense. The, while researchers may not actually use these specific words in their studies, most of the time they're using some strategies like these. So you kind of need to understand what these words and phrases mean so that you can find them in articles even when the researchers don't call them these words. Okay, so first of all, prolonged engagement and persistent observation are somewhat similar. And I want you to think about an ethnographic study. In an ethnographic study, the purpose is to understand the insider's meaning and understanding of a culture, a group of however we define culture that can be very broadly defined. So in order for me to understand what it would be like to be an insider of a specific culture, I have to spend enough time with the folks of that culture to really understand their day-to-day -day lives and the meanings that they attach to that. So for prolonged engagement and persistent observation, I'm not going to have you distinguish between the two of those because depending on the way you read it, it could be similar. But that means that I'm going to invest enough time to really understand the concept or the phenomena that I'm studying. So for an ethnographic study, I can't expect to go out in a week and become an expert at this culture for which I had no knowledge beforehand. Okay. Um, with reflexivity, a lot of qualitative researchers use reflective journaling or some other form of re reflexivity where I look at myself and I look at what do I know about this topic I'm studying? What do I believe? What are my biases or my prejudices about this topic? By writing it down and putting it in place, I can look at that and I can say, okay, I own that this is what I believe. And I'm bringing this into this study, but I really need to bracket this over here to the side for now, because when I'm listening to my participants in during the interview, I need to hear what they say. I don't need to hear what I think. It doesn't need to be shaded through my perceived thoughts and feelings. So reflexivity is important for many qualitative studies, and it's a very common strategy that qualitative researchers use. Now, when you see the word triangulation, that's not a word we use in everyday life, so it might seem a little confusing, but basically triangulation means looking at more than one thing to double check, what, um, double check our data. So that thing that I've referred to could be a bunch of different things. So first of all, data triangulation, there's three different types. There's time triangulation, space triangulation, and person triangulation. Basically, time triangulation means that we're going to collect data on more than one time. Because if the data is consistent at time A as it is in time B, then that lends more trustworthiness or more credibility to the results of my study. It's kind of similar to test-retest reliability, but not really. But the more... Um, we look across time and come up with the same results, the more trustworthy and believable these, the study actually is. For space triangulation, that means we're going to collect data in two different locations. So we may go to two different nursing homes, or we might go talk to nurses at a hospice agency and a home health agency and an inpatient hospital and maybe an outpatient standalone surgical center or urgent care. Because if we go to all of these different places and we're hearing similar stories, then that also enhances the credibility of the data that we have collected and are in the process of collecting. And then lastly is person triangulation. And that does not mean going to more than one person. You're going to do that anyway. 
unless you're doing a case study of just one person, you're going to have more than one person in your sample. What that means is talking to different types of people. So if we're talking about nursing burnout, of course we're talking to nurses, but we might want to include new graduate nurses, preceptors, educators, managers, maybe administrators of a hospital, different levels and types of people so that you get a better, bigger picture view of the phenomenon of interest from more people. And if all of them kind of boil down to the same thing, then again, that enhanced my credibility of my data collection. The final type of triangulation here during uh, data collection on this slide anyway, is method triangulation. That means using more than one method of data collection during the same study. Um, that could mean that I do observation and then I also do self-report through interview. So if I observe and I interview about the same topic and both of that type, both types of data agree, then that enhances the credibility of my study. Okay. The other things that I'm going to skip all the way down to member checking first, because that's probably one of the most common things you're going to see. Member checking means that I have taken the transcripts and I may have summarized them and then I send them back to the people whom I, I spoke with. So if I, if I um, interview John and I ask John these questions and I hear his story and I type it all up and then maybe I, I summarize his whole um, one hour interview into like two paragraphs. And I send it to Jean and I say, can you please read over this? Make sure I've captured the essence of what you wanted to say. Make sure that I have not misinterpreted you or misquoted you in any way. And I get that feedback back from John. And then I do the same thing with Susan. And I do the same thing with Abby. That's called member checking because I want to hear what they have to say. I don't want to interpret things that I believe or feel. Okay, so member checking is pretty common, especially in some of the phenomenological methods that you can see out there. Um, lastly, for audit trails or decision trails, that just means that the researchers keep a careful list of all of the decisions that they make. So if they decide to code um, certain statements as trying to fit in, and then they code these statements as um, reaching uh, uh, my maximum potential, just making up stuff off the top of my head, then they, we need to understand why they did that. They need to keep all of their notes from all of their meetings because somebody, anybody should be able to go in and look at their paperwork and understand that they really were meticulous in the decisions they made during data collection. And so when you're reading qualitative studies, you may see some of those things mentioned, especially in the methods section where they're talking about data collection, because they need to give us proof in their studies, in their articles, that they did a rigorous job of protecting the credibility and enhancing the trustworthiness of the data that was collected in their qualitative study.